this computer. Ooh. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, uh, July 30th, 2023. I'm Larry Rhodes or DJ Doubter5. And as usual, we have our co-host, DJ Wombat. Uh, hello, Wombat. <laughs> hey, I'm the Wombat. Yeah. Crank and boom. And uh, our guests today are Boudreaux. Welcome. Hey, hey. John Richards from England. Welcome. Hello. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. If you get the feeling that you're the only believer, non-believer, excuse me, in your town, well, you're just not. I'd wager on it. In Knoxville, here in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us, pretty much 1,100 now. Uh, we're Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break, so be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? Uh so we're going to go over more ideas of dogma popping up in places where they don't necessarily help the conversation move forward and also address some of the comments that were brought to us from last episode. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to just do a quick touching of base and seeing how everyone's how everyone has been. Then we can do a recap from last week's episode and go into the meat and potatoes of the show. John Richards, your quest of chaos over in UK. How have you been, my friend? Yeah, I've been fine. Thank you. Yep. And I'm getting on with a. Uh organizing the next event that we're staging in the midlands here Ooh, not yes not alabama not birmingham right. alabama. not that not the real the original yeah, i, I yeah, checked yeah. out i checked out birmingham alabama it's a little piddly little place of just about two hundred thousand people this birmingham is a million wow 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 <laughs> wow, 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 wow it's, wow, it's wow. the big daddy birmingham <laughs> Big Daddy Birmingham. We love it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a good time, and I hope you can get as good a fried chicken as the... As the <laughs> I'm other sure we Birmingham. can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, there, there, will be, there will be more news about this in the next few weeks, and okay. I've just launched the Eventbrite, the ticket sales site. Great, So great. it's coming along nicely. Looking forward to it. Uh, Boudreaux, of course, you're on next on the docket. Love the shirt. What's going on with you? Well, I'll tell you about the shirt, because that's... Most recently, I ran the Crank and Boom Sprint for Scoops. It's a 3K, nice. and you get to eat ice cream after you run. It's super hot, but it's right down the road, and we do it. This is maybe the fourth or fifth year we've done it, and uh, this year, I placed third in my Ooh, age group. Nice. Good. Yeah. And my daughter ran alongside me, and she Aww. placed first in her age group. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Time. That's great. Look at you. you, you... Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, I was thinking... The longer you stay running in those 5K events, the more harder the competition gets is what I is one of the things I had noted. So like back when I was doing 5Ks, when I just started college, I would get like maybe top five. And then after a while, it started being like 17 and then like 30th. And I did one recently earlier this year and I, I didn't even, I didn't get anywhere close to the podium. I was like 18, but when I looked around, it was just all the crazy dudes who like stuck around and kept doing it. So like yeah. third is like yeah. really, really good. Actually, you have to like, you have to like bias it that way. It's actually really nice. You're one of the guys that stuck around. That's awesome. Dry. <laughs> good job, man. Good job. And also congrats to, to the daughter for getting first place. That's awesome too. I, and you have a pantheon of trophies in your garage. I've seen that before. So yeah. good job on getting another one. Good job on getting another one. Larry, how have you been, my friend? I'm doing fine. Um, still just working and playing computer games. What's I finished up uh, Horizon New Dawn. Yeah. Been going back in and complete the map and stuff. Might run out of quests, though. Did you May get the true armor? Some... Did you get the true armor that, like, replenishes your health? And, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Okay, then. Yeah, you... it looks good, especially in those cold climbs. Yes. It's uh, yeah. it's really, really good. Um, I'm yeah. glad you scraped the bottom of the barrel of that game. It's a fun game. What's the next one on the plate, if you have one? Oh, well, there's one coming out in September. Uh, it's a space game. Uh, can't, the name doesn't come to me right off. Star Child? Starfield? Um, Starfield. There it Starfield. is. Starfield. Okay, yeah. okay. It's by the same people who did uh, um, oh, Skyrim. Correct. So it should be awesome. It should be awesome. <laughs> it should be awesome. <laughs> We're going to take that quote and put it on the top of the box. We're just like, okay. it should be awesome. Just 
this would be good yeah. uh so guys i've been pretty good it's been really really hot i know it's only going to get hotter but we've taken opportunities to uh participate with some uh disc golf leagues that we're starting at a local school we have a 3d printing lab at our site so we're actually able to print 3d discs and we can change the top shape of the plate or the bottom shape of the plate and then have the kids try them out and explain why the discs fly differently as a result of changing their aerodynamics so like we are literally allowing them to design a disc on a course that they built themselves more or less they planted the trees uh we helped wow. we didn't help we didn't help to get the land, but we did help them to like figure out how to use the land well to like make a full uh, mm -hmm. nine hole course like properly. And um, they made the T pads themselves. So like the the sixth graders made the T pads, then they got ready to go to seventh grade. So now we have a new generation of kids who are like constantly working on this course. It's really great. Um, the 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 main thing I'd like to say is it's fun to be outdoors. It's fun to get be active. And I want everyone to appreciate um, like the idea that we are alive once and we have this beautiful thing outside called nature. We should take opportunities to enjoy it. Don't just play video games like Larry, though he deserves. Larry, you've had a long life. You deserve to do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. I've been outside a lot. <laughs> He's doing it. But take your 5Ks, do your quest for chaos in Birmingham, Alabama. Do uh, whatever you need to do for uh, motorcycling. But I wanted to talk about how we made the internet upset uh, yesterday uh, or, or last week, because we did a show on the aspect of trans inclusion or trans women inclusion in female sports and why that was such a heated debate and why there's so much dogma involved in that conversation and how much better it would be if we removed the dogma and left more room for science and empathy to take place, to have a more pragmatic and productive conversation. However, in the process of talking about it, even just the nature of it, we found that like there's a lot of contentious baggage or words with a lot of baggage that people will ask for definitions on and not agree even on the definitions because there's a lot of there's a lot of potential minefields even with the way how people interpret these words. And so I thought that's a fair statement. We never really define what we meant by things like cis or trans or even woman or even gender. At the top, we just sort of jumped in with the assumption that we all knew what those terms meant. And then likewise, we never really, and this is, excuse me, we never, excuse me, if you ever see me playing with my nose, I'm trying to hold back a sneeze. Bless you. Excuse me. Bless you. Thank, you. Thank, bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Anyway. Uh, no, no, no. Gesundheit, not bless no, you. No, no, no. They don't own that word. I can say bless you. It's all good. <laughs> I do feel blessed. Uh, so I would say this too. Um, the idea so we had a lot of comments that were valid with regard to how we handle that conversation uh nothing that was like particularly like needling at any of us there was one question of like hey you guys consider yourself non-dogmatic where's your actual proof we'll go over those in the show but what i did want to start off with was um a comment that i'll lead with boudreaux as a response for and this is from a friend of the show who uh his name is robin she's been on the show before or uh they have been on the show before our robin asks in the ongoing conversations about transgender inclusion in sports i believe it's crucial to clarify the definitions we use especially the term cis over time its meaning has evolved rapidly leading to misunderstandings and miscommunication so as someone in my 50s i vividly remember when female athletes challenging or challenging societal norms with, uh, I'm sorry, I vividly remember when female athletes challenging societal norms was groundbreaking, as sports were predominantly seen as a male domain. When women who participated in sports defied gender-based stereotypes, that was a new circumstance. And it's intriguing now to see how the majority of women in sports are now labeled as cis, aligning with the cultural expectations linked to their biological sex. This observation makes me wonder how much this debate has become generational. Could we delve into these changing definitions and how changing definitions impact our dialogue and how generational perspectives influence the way we approach topics? And so, Eric, my question for you is, isn't, do you not see a case for not just on trans, but like what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be black or white, change over time and leading to more complications on how we can have meaningful conversations to come to learn how we can treat each other better or or and how dogmatic approaches to 
I know what this definition is. It's not changing. This is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. Can actually get in the way. You want to speak to that for a bit? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't on the call last week, so I, I didn't. I don't know all the nuances of your conversation there, but but tying it into Christianity and dogmatic thinking, uh, uh, first thing my mind went to is you know a lot of uh, I would say successful or clever progressive you know churches dogmatic thinkers mm. have kind of shifted with modernity you know when it comes to things like you know gay rights and um and a, a other progressive things that you know they're realizing we're gonna we're gonna lose you know um uh butts and pews if we don't yep. kind of accept certain things so i uh I, if if that's kind of if i take w what your question is i i do see that there are going to be some some religions that just you know uh uh, uh draw the line in the sand and say no we're, we're not changing on this this is how it is and but but others and i think the the ones that are going to survive uh or or you know become more popular are going to be the ones that do change so yeah. can i ask can i ask of, oh go ahead larry go for it i was just going to say yeah the problem is that the book doesn't change yeah. and the, the preachers uh sometimes can work around that by retranslating their meanings of it uh but the book itself has very definite words that cannot, you know, right. be resold in a different way. And some mm -hmm. people don't want to do that and will die, go to the cross or go to the, you know, die on that hill, as it were. So does that mean that the book won't survive? Because I mean, the book's been doing a pretty good job surviving. What are you, what are you saying? Well, no, I think it's going to survive. And that's the problem. We just have to uh, realize people have to come to the realization that it's not gospel. It's not true it's not it's a story in other words it's a collection of stories that may or may not have any um relevance and 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 reality as it were we we did see uh, a pretty big change when uh, the old testament got pushed away and the new testament came in i mean that I, will we see something like that in our well, lifetime I mean, yeah well, think about it well, going yeah, ahead, you, like every 200 years, go ahead. Larry. Yeah, well, the thing about it is uh, there was no concept of hell before the New Testament. So, I mean, it, it brought some good stuff, admittedly, uh, but it also brought some very bad stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, Jefferson tried to get rid of, uh, Thomas Jefferson, that is, tried to get rid of all the old stuff and, and get rid of the miracles and stuff. He he created his own Jeffersonian Bible. You can look it up on the internet. You can actually buy it on Amazon if you wanted to. But the Bible, you know, the old Bible still pers perseveres, as it were. And that's a problem. Boudreaux, my follow-up would be, you know, we had the Old Testament and people still just follow old testament like there's there's so many judaic religions that are just yeah. old testament the new testament is like an add-on dlc pack if you will larry because he's the gamer <laughs> in the room. and then we have mormons and then we have well uh islam like when you think about it like all these things are tied all these major religions are actually fundamentally tied to the same judaic gospel and um and then there's offshoots from that that are completely unrelated jehovah witnesses uh that still have something that looks very similar to the bible but they would claim is a very different thing it's bifurcation and i feel like through that bifurcation or that fragmentation and separation we still get stratified things that fall off and die because they just couldn't keep up with the times and then new versions that are like new flavors of ice cream on your t-shirt that are just popular enough to maintain until the next generation i think that's how religion stays alive uh, go on ahead, John. It sounds like you, you're on mute, my buddy. Go on ahead, say what you got to say. Oh no, he's on mute. Okay, he says. I mean, can we, did you? Let me go. Okay. Yeah. I, there I you had, go. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I I slid the window up to the side and couldn't get to the un, unmute button. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. There's the the Bible has never really been gospel, the way the Christians would like to make out that it has been. It's never really been. The immutable word of God, because as you pointed out, there was the Old Testament and then there was the update. The New Testament came okay. along. And so they, they've already got the problem of trying to reconcile those two different versions of how society should be run. But what I discovered very recently is in 19th, early 19th century England, a special Bible was produced for use in the British West Indies 
it was the Negro Slaves Bible. Well, I mean, it's shameful to talk about it today, isn't it? Go, go but, ahead. but back then, the Bible was a colonial tool. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's cheaper yes. than bullets. Yep. In fact, in fact, once you've got people on board to it, they'll pay you for for more of that service mm. by making collections. Very true. So this particular slave Bible, as it came to be called, it uh, omitted. Uh, let me have a look. Um, Exodus, the book of Psalms, the book why of would, Revelations. Why in the world would they take out Exodus of all books? It's such a great book <laughs> and learning how to treat other people how they want to be treated. That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they thought that <laughs> they thought that it could instill in slaves a dangerous hope for freedom and dream <laughs> of quality. <laughs> So, yeah, we have and listen, even within Christian one single Christian denomination, they may have different variations of the same holy book. You know, mm. uh, how yeah. many different versions of the, the standard Christian book is there from mm. King's James to like uh, New International Version yeah. to the mm. modified text, like to mm. the highlighted ones with additional commentary from like 14 mm. different other biblical scholars. Yeah, yeah. Like mm. these are all you're you're influencing and correcting and citing mm. and mm. putting mm. ear notes on god's yep. holy book that seems mm -hmm. that seems fairly audacious to me um mm -hmm. what I, I wanted to comment on what larry was saying because i think there's some slight tweaking that i would say you said people need to realize that the it's the bible's not true i agree that people need to realize i would say it, to more nuanced point it's not so much that the bible isn't true because i don't want to have to go through that effort to to prove something not that is a negative i'd rather just realize that there's more reliable systems to determine what is true than just looking at the bible or using faith. And I'll apply that to back to the trans conversation that we were having last week, because the science, at least with regard to physiological differences between uh, biological males and females, right? Like men, women, I'm trying to, or uh, male, female, I'm trying to make a point that the scientific data has, has unanimously determined that there's physiological differences between the two. Um, it, it is It is just what it is. And while that might upset people, it's it, the the path forward isn't to obscure that data or ignore it. It's just recognize it and then reconcile with coming up with still better ways to treat people in light of this reality, rather than you know saying this doesn't exist and we'll just venture forward with our definitions and our movement. Like we have a good way of determining objective reality with science, and we can still be empathetic on top of that. And so uh, my recommendation would be. Uh, we need to realize that we have very reliable systems that are testable, that are falsifiable, that are repeatable, and this is good. And we should listen to or at least use that method in congruence with how we uh, come up with rules to like best protect people and, and serve our interests. Um, any, any, any concerns or, or disagreements? Well, yeah, I think at least we're taking the, the position that it's a problem to be solved. You know, it's something that we need to work on and get better at later on, you know, as we understand the problem more uh, right. going forward. It, it is not black and white and something to be solved simply by referring to an old book exactly. or an, a, an old way of thinking. Yes, you know? yes. And if anything, we need a new yes. book. <laughs> we need a new book. Well, <laughs> new books become old books before long. You know, what the you, other thing that the other thing that I love about we need a new method. How's that? And that oh, yeah, method yeah. is science a scientific is method. <laughs> science is all about new methods. Science is also yeah. about giving us usable words to work with, usable definitions, or like clearly defined <laughs> terms. Yeah, because down with books, down with books. <laughs> <laughs> lacking meaningful uh variables or definitions we're talking past each other and i feel like that goes to both the generational divide on certain aspects like what does it mean to be black what does it mean to be christian it's a very different thing to be christian today than it meant 60 years ago right or even 100 yeah. years ago or 200 mm -hmm. years ago so let's not just say the same words and assume we mean the same thing if there was a better way to express something let's let's look at those definitions but let's use a scientific approach so that we can define them very well test them out make sure they meet the definition and if we need to talk about something outside of that term we just come up with a new definition but we just can't if we're going to come up with new words for something you got to make them clear what you're talking about otherwise you're only 
obfuscating what could be a very productive conversation. And so, yes, I do think there are generational perspectives that influence how we think, how we talk to each other. And I do think the words we use change. I do think the science that we use also changes, but tends to get us closer to a, a specified target. And we'll and when we change science, it's typically when we're evolving to like a very specific point. Um, and that's okay too. So like Jonathan, I will I'll throw this question out at you. Um, I just said science changes. Is that true in your opinion? And do you think that's a fair thing to say? Yes. And it's one of the strengths because we don't have a doctrine that we stick to dogmatically. Mm -hmm. We know that we are only making models of the universe mm -hmm. and we know that we can't show them to be 100 percent absolute because tomorrow we might discover something inconsistent. So mm -hmm. the only way we can say that we were right will be at the end of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe even so it's it's a strength it's being able to let go of something and realize that you were wrong right that's that's the only way we right. can be certain about something when it's proved to be wrong uh larry well yeah uh, i'd like to say that the only way that we very, you can disprove science is with more science right yeah. you, there's not one time where it, where like the bible has proven science wrong Right. Wow. Yeah. The the great thing about the scientific approach is that it's open to new data and willing to modify models as a result. And that's not a right. failure of science. That's just a demonstration. That's the, the, the strength of science. Of science. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I say there's room for science in an empathetic conversation about how to treat people because it's science that doesn't have a horse on the in the race. Like science is in the interest of trying to come up with just accurate ways to express how right. reality works it's just yeah. the models that we use to understand how things are and yeah. it will yeah. change and adapt as a result and it's yeah. one of the best tools that we have we should be using it. Ask, Larry. ask newton and einstein oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> for instance We're both dead. Uh, is that good <laughs> how many times have you have you seen a, a a person come online saying they've proven evolution wrong right but they right. not a single one of them have put up for a nobel prize which actually would want would win right if right, they right. could prove evolution wrong right i mean right, because right. we want uh, scientists want to be proven wrong if they are wrong mm. i mean they're looking for truth not you know not you know proving that their answer is right for all time they mm. want to know the truth right right and we just want to be able to understand things in a consistent way that's also the thing with uh, yeah, yeah. As well. this is a big difference between the the mindset of people who think scientifically and those who think theistically because, dogmatically exactly because they own their doctrine they 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 can't justify it and point and say look there's the you know there's the explanation there's the fact they have to own it and claim it and argue for it right so it's their baby mm. <laughs> and, so and as a result of which they hate to be proven wrong. They hate to have anybody criticize them because mm. they have face to lose. They, they will be humiliated, embarrassed because they've nailed their flag to the wrong mast. Am yeah, I mixing, well, up, am yeah, I mixing well, yeah. up the metaphors here? This is where we need mm -hmm. dread to come in and have a pirate's mm -hmm. mast. Right. So, Boudreaux, I'll throw this out at you. You are outspokenly atheist. You are outspokenly fans of boring people who've written books before i forget i it's, it, i forgot the name already that's that's how much six of me was it ham saris ham saris there you go sam ham saris there it is i'm wondering you know in the event that you ever find out that you actually were wrong how how big of a crush your ego would that be and how 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 quickly can we expect to see some you know jesus flags or cthulhu flags <laughs> in your car like, well, are you I, I, are you so pro atheist that if it was ever proven to you that a god does exist, you would you would just keep it under your hat and not share it with everybody? I, I think that's okay. Fantastic question, and mm -hmm. I have to be poetic and quote Sam Harris and say one of the things he said. He said over and over again is, "I don't want to be wrong uh, any longer than than uh, I have to be." So I'm with him on that. Like, okay, uh, I I don't want to be right about being an atheist, or I don't want to be. Um, an atheist just because that's what i you know identify as right um, that's just where my logic has has led me 
And that's where I am. So, and and that's and that's a good point too. Uh, one of the things we talk about in our summit group is, you know, the Dawkins scale of of um, belief. Mm-hmm. What well, one of the points of it is a seven is a a, a gnostic atheist. It's an, an atheist that knows there's no God. Mm-hmm. And and I'm I'm not that. I'm a you know slightly below seven, which is a an agnostic atheist. Right. I don't know if there's a God. Yes or no but I don't believe in one. So right. yeah, if, if someone ever, and I've even said on the, on the program with you guys and and to, to maybe folks dismay that, you know, I, I don't even need that much um, proof of, of a God, just, just a few things. Like if all religions had exactly the same uh, uh, origin story, or mm. if, if uh, I mean, if they're just, they're, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take a lot, at least if, for a young me to, to, to stay with, uh, to, with religion, um, if it wasn't but, so geo locked, right? Like if it yeah, was yeah, some consistency, it, yeah, messaging made sense uh, across different groups. Yeah, like, then you can at least say, "Oh, it's all pointing to the same thing." We just have different points of view based on how we're brought up. But yeah. this seems to be very, but, very varied. Like we talked about the cross, the very simple right. symbol that yeah, you happen to see among you know several religions, but you know, drop a bunch of toothpicks on the ground and you're gonna see crosses. If there was a really elaborate, even like the Star of David, if the Star of David existed in every religion, mm. you know, I'd be like, hmm. But okay. yeah, to your point, yes. I I if if God came down here and and did his whole whole uh, dog and pony show again, yeah, I would I would uh I'd get in line to to you know cool. then what Jesus. I want to so we're going to take a break. When we get back, I'd love to talk about how the difference between how we identify versus what's actually just a descriptor for us, because that's also one of the definitions I was asked for in the show. And then maybe we can actually figure out some of these other topics that we spoke so brazenly about last week, but never really actually defined. Larry, would you mind taking us out? Sure. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Cool. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter Five, and we're on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's just take a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now and have over 1,000 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's old city at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top table, or if it's pretty outside, uh, go outside on the deck. You can find us online in Facebook, meetup.com, or at our home page, knoxvilleatheists.org. You can also just Google Knoxville Atheists. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one. Start, Start one. one. Right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? I wanted to talk a lot more about R. Robbins' uh, post with regarding the words that we use as potentially prone to generational changes and how the change of a definition can actually lead to a lot of conflict with regard to how people might identify with certain terms versus how they express certain terms and how other people in- interpret them. And so one of the things I realized is how much of the terms that we identify with are inherently just cultural. For example, I identify as like a black guy. However, when I moved from California to Georgia, that meant a very different thing. You know, being black in California versus being black in the South, completely different, completely different. One was like uh, something that was like more or less a non-issue, but I always stood out. And the other one was I fit in, but it's a different thing. And if you don't, if you weren't updated on the program, you're, you're, you're falling behind. And there was a lot of stuff I had to catch up on. Then I moved to Sweden for a while. And being black meant completely different, completely different yeah. thing than when I came back here. People were talking to me like Egyptian and 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 mm-hmm. other languages I never heard before. I'm like, oh my gosh, what do you what do you see when you see me? And I realized that I had a very particular view of myself, but I didn't value or understand or appreciate or even be was aware of how much other people see me and how I need to be aware of that as well and how much that influences who I am in a particular culture. And so now if you were asking me like, how do I identify as a black guy? In my mind, it's more of like, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of an identification aspect, but for me, it's more of like just a descriptor. Like I would describe myself as black for sure, 
but it's not that there's a singular flag that I can wave and be like, this is what it means to be black. I'm a proper representation of what that means to be black. This is me. This is me 10,000%. It's more of like, hey, it's okay to be black. I'm just one of a lot of different kinds of black people out there. I'll be happy to talk to you about my personal experience. I just want to highlight that it's cool to be, you know, an outspoken black scientist, cool guy. But as far as like identity, like if you were to ask me as how what I identify, it's like I like playing disc golf. <laughs> I like working on my car. Mm -hmm. I like eating burritos. But these are the things that describe me don't aren't necessarily are me, right? Like it's not necessarily how I'm identifying. It's just really cool ways to describe who I am that like play yeah. into my personality. But there are things that I more closely identify with. If you're willing to like have a relationship with me and talk to me, I can tell you what those things are. Well, since so, this is a radio show, yes, I, I'd like to <laughs> tell listeners that I am actually green. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes on the edges. So I mm -hmm. wonder, I feel like the things that I identify with are less prone to changing by culture. I feel like that's the general rule. So like when I say I like disc golf, 40 years from now, that might be the same sport, right? Like that's still going to be disc golf. But like what it means to be black could be a completely different thing compared to when my grandpa was alive to where I am now. So I would love to throw out a question. The things that you identify with versus the things that just describe you. So, for example, John Richards, I'm going to throw something out at you, and I, don't take me it's the wrong way, but you are very English. You, you take a lot of pride in England, but what it meant to be English from Crusades times all the way to now, like that, that has changed. A lot of, a lot of things have changed with like England and who knows where you will be a hundred years from now or whatever. So is there, would you say that's more just a line with a descriptor or do you think it's unfair for me to say that you uh, identify with something that could just change and you only identify with it now? I'm, I'm searching for a question here. What I would love to just get your thoughts. What do you think? <laughs> well, yeah, um, what it means to be English has changed enormously during my lifetime, especially mm. as this country has become increasingly cosmopolitan. You know, we, we now have many people, millions of people who have come back from what used to be the colonies and have settled here. So mm. we're a mixed community now, far more than we were when I was a boy. You never saw anybody who wasn't Anglo-Saxon when right. I was a boy. Mm. But now it's it's difficult to avoid seeing people who obviously aren't Anglo-Saxon. But uh, Ty, do, would you would you consider yourself to be a coconut? <laughs> no, I would not consider myself to be a coconut. I, I could say that's not that would be an inaccurate descriptor of me. And I also do not identify as a coconut. Those would be the two you, things you, I would say. You've got the expression in the U US, have you? A coconut? What is a coconut? What are you about to say? It's um, brown on the outside and white on the inside. Ah, so I don't mm. assign my values of being able to speak clearly and, and represent myself professionally as inherently a white attribute. Like, I feel like I, I can easily demonstrate that Black people have always had that skill set. Yeah. And I find, like, the terms of, like, coconut sort of mm. like, oh, well, you're rough on the outside, but the inside of you is good. I find that inherently <laughs> problematic as a way to well, model how yeah. people can behave, well, right? It's sort of like there's too much credit to, like, a race that you, had nothing to impact on that. Yeah, you stereotyped me as an Englishman, but in fact, <laughs> most of my living relatives are Africans because <laughs> about what, uh, over 20 years ago now, I, I married a Ghanaian woman mm. who was in this country training to be a nurse at the time. And we have two daughters that are mixed and all of, all of my personal family line are now dead, or I think there's a couple still alive, but I lost touch with him. But her, because she is a bit younger, so her brothers and sisters and cousins and so on are very much in my personal circle of friends. Mm. So, so if there was a reverse to a coconut, that's what I'd be. What can you think of that's white on the outside, brown in the middle? Is a chalk ice? No, no, not a chalk ice. No, no. Maybe we can um, working on it. Maybe we can work. Keep working. Yeah, you have it. to think, think of think of something for me. But I would say these things would be like whether they are a bit obtuse uh, descriptors and not so much identifiers. Like I would say, like uh, there are clearly words that people identify. With. I'm an American, or I'm a man, 
or I'm trans or uh, I'm, you know, a Foo Fighters fan or something like that. It's like, I understand that you identify strongly with these, but what if Foo Fighters came out with a terrible album? You know, their next album was just like, <laughs> You're like, are you still food first? Like, I'm die hard. It's like, okay, so like maybe there's a dogmatic approach to like how you are coming with how you identify yourself because it doesn't seem to be affected by the thing that you're identifying with. And maybe there's a cultural divide as culture or society moves a certain way, your identity is going with it or against it. And maybe that yeah. might yeah. enlighten us to the things that we identify with aren't necessarily us, but just ways to describe yeah. us. And if that's the case, maybe we can take them away from personally being offended when we're talking about terms and get closer to more of a scientific or empathetic approach to resolving how we should treat each other, particularly people with different identifiers or descriptors. Uh, Eric, I'd love to know, uh, what do you identify with versus what would you just say describes you? <clears throat> well, um, definitely this is, you know, something I've talked about with, with others before that surprises people, but, you know, a descriptor for me is, is, you know, don't have a full head of hair, you know, and that, and that's, uh, no, it is something that I've noticed is something that I, I feel I get judged by when I first meet a person, you okay. know? Okay. Okay. And it, it, it doesn't do anything to identify. <laughs> um, sure. Historically, you've yeah. actually had a full on, yeah. full on ponytail. Yeah. 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 So uh, th that's something that, I mean, it's I'm nowhere near, I think what, what uh, you as, as, as described as being black has, has gone through, but it's definitely something well, I'll, I'll put a hat on when I go out to meet new people. Cause it's so much easier than, you know, you know just, you get put in a, a category, I think. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. But okay. in terms of identify, you know, it, it, it you, you know, the, you know, atheism and Sam club, Sam Harris, and, but you're right. Uh, you know, someone can, the Foo Fighters could put out a horribly racist album which I seriously doubt they ever would. And, and, you know, it would change my sure, sure, opinion. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, 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 yeah. sure. They just call it coconuts. They just say, this every time about coconuts, coconut, <laughs> coconut. It's like, oh, Foo Fighters, what have you done? <laughs> you can't, um, you can't have coconuts in a small town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to uh, ask you this then. So like, if you identify as an atheist and for whatever reason, atheist becomes more militant or, or mm -hmm. more, in your face about, listen, it's about time we stop subjecting our children to this yeah, religious yeah, yeah. protocol, and we are going to start our own state, and it's going to be the state of Vermont, right. and this is where the state where only atheists, true atheists are, and everyone who's a real atheist lives here, so let's ask this again. Are you an atheist? Are you yeah. not an atheist? Now they're looking at you, uh, <laughs> Luigi, what's going on? Yeah, here? no, I'm with you. You know, it, I identify with something for as long as it, you know, properly, you know, mm. uh, uh, m sits well with me. Yeah. If you, you start changing the, uh, the way atheists are grouped together and do that. Yeah. It, it, and I think that's why a lot of, uh, I've even heard a lot of atheists don't even like the term atheism because it describes what you're not. It doesn't mm. describe what you are. Right. And, you know, humanist, secularist, you know, those are maybe better terms, uh, famously bad, bad religions lead singer. Greg Graffin has said he doesn't like the term atheist. He likes uh, humanists or other things oh, like that. So yeah, well, I, I would, yeah. Yeah, like maybe a lowercase atheist, like in the sense of I'm not a part of a yeah. group, like I'm not right. like fundamentally, yeah. you know, screwing, but like I am an atheist, but like, yeah. like, let's talk about what that means. And if you don't want to talk about what that means, then you don't really want to know me. So at best, yeah. don't identify me with that. Just describe me as that, unless you actually want to understand where I'm coming from, you know? It's a good well, point. Like, I, yeah. I was just going to say that when a group uh, generally has an awful lot of negative baggage, you might want to identify as not being part of that group, like right. I'm not a MAGA type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, I think it's important in some places to, to identify as a negative. Right. Mm -hmm. Only because yeah. we understand that the words can have baggage that changes with it over time. Though yeah. I do find the fight with letting people know that I'm an atheist is is part is part just fighting the the bad swell of propaganda that's presented with atheism it's yeah. to show them an example of no i am an atheist i want you to know that not because i want you to be an atheist but just because i want you to know what an atheist looks like you know yes. and i find that to be inherently valuable because i don't think the the wellspring of bad press has gotten to the point where i can't express that in 
among my friends and and family and even like uh just average coworkers and just present myself and just let that be the case but that not everybody can do that I, and i also understand it too i am privileged in that capacity what do you think larry when it comes to using the word atheist i'm not going to avoid using it just because it offends the very people that made it a curse in the first place there you go larry i like it i like it uh so i am willing to throw that out as in my point in my mind as like hey this is how you can describe me and i want anyone else you know who has this descriptor on them to say oh wait a second maybe they're not necessarily bad people and then if you want to talk about what that means to me like how i identify as an atheist what do i do to like demonstrate my atheism and and express that that could be i could be something that i can both identify and be used to describe so they aren't even mm -hmm. mutually exclusive terms i can say oh, yeah i identify with a lot of aspects of really the one main aspect of atheism which is i'm just not convinced that a god exists that's really all there is to it but i can describe past that all the impacts that's had on how i think rationally and what i think about other religions and and how i uh i hold conversations with people what i do on the weekends talking to you guys i think there's a lot that goes into it um so i think that might oh go ahead john richards well i've been on a journey because mm -hmm. having having been born to non-believing parents and mm. living in a culture at the time for the first 20 years of my life i suppose where nobody had the slightest bit of interest in religion it didn't matter what you called yourself but then i became aware of very religious people mm. who had demonized the word atheist and we people like me began to look for a a softer way of describing ourselves and some of us called ourselves agnostics or secularists right. or humanists mm. in, in fact we've come through that now we're more out there you know willing to be forthright and say that we are atheists because right. there's a couple of good reasons one is there's no evidence for any god and the other one is religions are divisive so, you know, there's two good reasons not to be a member of any religion. Let me throw let me throw a counter to that, just because I know this, the comments are already being typed up. There is real evidence for God. The thing is, it just doesn't reach the standard to cause one to be <laughs> valid or justified in believing that there is a God. Yeah. Just because I wrote a book that says a God existed is not enough evidence for me to say, oh, well, now our poor God exists. So the evidence yeah. that, that is out there is lacking, which is why I don't believe in a God. In my mind, if a God is an incredible being, I should have an incredible amount of evidence. I have not seen that amount of evidence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as a result, I have nothing but my lack of convincing. <laughs> and if I'm not convinced, I'm not going to believe it. And so that's why that's where I'm at as an atheist. And yes, I absolutely agree. Religion is divisive. I think it's it is essentially a cell of terms. When you think about a religion, it's basically just a cult of terms, right? that people throw at each other in terms of dividing people into groups, in terms of how they want to identify with themselves with regard to how they call things. And they make a, a very dogmatic microculture that yeah. is very inflexible with the, the move of society and particularly the advancements of science. And so yeah. when you have a situation like that, you basically have essentially, in my mind, a very intolerant group that is can only survive by forcing culture to change or not change with it or like press culture into its shape or further separate people to the point where they're not willing to talk to each other anymore so that you yeah, can yeah. keep yourself uh isolated and i find both well, situations terrible and that's why i say we need to rely on science and empathy what do you think here's Sean? an interesting thing because mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago i went to bristol because i was i'd been invited to speak to bristol humanists you know, I, I, I go around the country and I do presentations nice. and I do debates and, and stuff and I organize events. But anyway, in Bristol, at this desecrated church, <laughs> they hold their meetings. Bristol humanists hold their meetings in a building that was formerly a church. And so the first thing I did was I asked them, I said, listen, I, I belong to Humanism UK, too, like you. And I'm I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak to this humanist meeting. But now, before I start, put your hands up if you actually consider yourselves not only to be a humanist, but also an atheist. Mm. Everyone except two. Hmm. 
everyone except who raised their hand? Yep. Okay. 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 In interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You could. So were they religious then? Would that be the only alternative? Yeah. Did you get a chance to talk to them more? Well, as individuals, no. But yes. I, I, I delivered my presentation which was about 20, okay. 20 No, I was, I was just wondering if you had a chance to flesh out the reasons for being a humanist, but not claiming to be an atheist. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd have a guess. Can I just hazard? Yeah, because you didn't, you didn't get it from yeah, I bet they. I bet they think I bet they think they're agnostic. Yeah. And it's it's the same. It's the trouble with definitions where like, oh, no, right. no, I'm not. Right. I'm not positive. There's no God. I'm, right. a, I'm an agnostic. That would be my right. guess. Too. And that's that's why I love the science approach to this, because we need to have these definitions well defined. And that way we understand what we're saying when we say things. That's what else whole words for. Right? Well, let's take a moment to define it. Thank you, Larry. I was just about to go to it. So I would say <laughs> I would say agnostic is a measure of me not believing in a God. And no. Then, no, 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 no. It's no, because I no. don't have a soul. It's because I have a soul. No. And Agnostic no, no, no. has to no, do no, with no. knowledge, you're, not you're, belief. You're, you're being racist against me. Agnostic means I have a soul <laughs> and I hate God. And it's all about belief. It's a belief statement, 10,000%. And uh, yeah. and atheism just means I love eating babies. All right, go ahead. Oh, I okay, I didn't know you were being tongue in cheek. Sorry. <laughs> well, listen, I've come up with I've come up with the reverse of coconut. Okay. Which, okay. Which fits me. Okay. It's okay. Christmas cake, white on Christmas the outside. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. let's get the real definitions out. Would 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 anyone like to do the real definitions? Uh, sure. Larry, go for sure. it. Yeah. Well, agnostic, the word gnostic comes from the word, Greek word knowledge. Right. So if you're an agnostic about God, you have you claim to have no knowledge of God. Hmm. If theism comes from the Greek word for, for belief, if you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. If you're a theist, you do. Personally, I'm both. I don't know that there's a God or not, but I don't believe in any. And so if I don't believe in any, no matter what my knowledge state is, that part of me is atheism. Mm. Bujo, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I did. No, that's that's the perfect definition. But I, yeah, I, I like to think of agnostic agnosticism about about yeah. Um, uh, do you know there's a God or you don't know there's a God? And and, yeah. uh, and you're spot on. And, and those people that didn't raise their hand, I guarantee they think of themselves as somewhere in between an atheist and a theist, which really practically doesn't exist. You know, you can't. I'm I'm both. Yeah, you can't live you. yeah you, you can't live on a line exclusive terms yeah yeah but right. you can't you can't be um a, not an atheist and not a theist you can't be in between correct there's no that. middle ground so, there yeah there's no middle yeah. ground. Yeah. yeah on on the idea of like it's a true dichotomy to either be a theist or not a theist we've just called right. not a theist an atheist because that a in yeah. the front just means not a yeah. so yeah. it's a exactly. true no lack of middle ground it's one of the logical uh absolutes uh, yeah. So I want to throw out because we're specifically asked this: How do we define sex and gender? And I want to throw it out to John Richards first because he uh, was a, is a, a scientist biologist. How would you define sex? And if you'd love to tackle it, how would you define gender? Good question. Sex is a biological characteristic, mm. and I've just read an article mm -hmm. by Richard Hopkins that he wrote about ten years ago. Because sex is one of those few things that is actually polar with no middle. You know, most, most things, no. they have a range and they extend from extreme one end to extreme the other. And a normal distribution curve, sex isn't <coughs> like that. There's only vanishingly small 0.02% of the population that is not identifiably by their chromosomes as male or female. Larry, you're going to say something, then I'm going to say something immediately afterwards. Can we just stay on sex real quick, Vic? Larry, what? what sure. No, I was just going to say that there are masculine women and effeminate males. You know, there, there are a whole spectrum so, there. Not so even getting we're talking into about, uh, bisexual. We were, talking about, we were talking about sex. I mean, we were talking about sex, like specifically your biological characteristics. What you do personally, or how you decide, decide to dress, or what hobbies you take on. I would, I would throw that outside of the sex point of view. Sex is you're opinion. talking about the, the actual chromosome. I'm talking about gametes. I'm talking about like, yeah. like the way how I the way how I see sex is sort of like it's in my opinion also a binary system. I have like I have a left foot and I have a right foot, 
I can wear shoes. I can wear a left shoe and a right shoe. And someone else can wear a left shoe and a right shoe. But you could also be barefoot. You could also wear two left shoes on both your feet. You can also wear two right shoes. But you still only have two shoes. Just because you have no shoes or you're wearing two of the same shoe on both your feet doesn't mean that you came up with a brand new kind of shoe. And so I'm aware that there's people that have modifications to their chromosomes or weird offshoots that seem like they're like a brand new sex, but it's not a brand new shoe to wear two different of the same shoes on both feet. It's it's still two ingredients that were just arranged in such a way that makes it harder for you to walk <laughs> in a way in a sense which does it, which demands some sympathy and care and empathy for that regard but i wouldn't say like oh you came up with a brand new shoe you're shoeless right okay like, so yeah there's not a third sex I'll, I, I'll agree there yeah 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 and not having not having shoes doesn't mean that you figured out and invented a new kind of shoe so like in my head it's just combinations of like two two very basic chromosomes to end up with like a biological characteristic and that's what sex is. Now, as far as what gender is, is like our societal, cultural, our stereotypical, uh, our psychological, our ex ways of expression. Like that goes, I'll, I'll give credence that I don't have a scientific appreciation for gender as much as I do sex. And that's my personal bias as just a scientist. But I understand that there's a lot of other categories that gender falls or, or encapsulates and that sex is very much like its own specific thing. Uh, Buju, I saw you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm not an expert in, in any of this, uh, but I, I I did take slight issue with the way you framed it, John. Um, you acted like this is, what did you call the the term atheist and theist, a, a polar something, Ty? Did you, uh, yeah, I, or no, absolute, you called it absolute, uh, anyway, you, you used the term that. Mutually non-exclusive or mutually exclusive? Or well, there's the, a logical the absolute is, that says there's no middle yes. ground? Yeah. There's no there. middle ground. Yes. You, you kind of you kind of framed sex as no middle ground, uh, John. But then you pointed out 0.02 uh, percent there there. So there is there a middle ground or isn't there a middle ground? I'm, I, I guess I'm confused. Bujo, can, may I, may I address that? I think uh, it was that's why I brought up the shoe example. So yes, okay. uh, it's basically like there's 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 two sexes. And there is some degree of overlap between the two, but that degree of overlap or the lack of a sex that can't be assigned yeah. isn't the representation of a brand new third tier of sex. Right. Okay. Okay. It's okay. a binary system with some with on the individual basis, some overlap, but overall it's, it's something that's like very easily categorized as like, it's just two things. Yeah. Like it, having two shoes. Go ahead, John. It, it's strongly binary. The, the, but the proportions of those who don't fit into one or the other category at birth mm. is tiny. Yeah. And right. negligible. And the However, ones that... oh, go on. this this is a moving feast, isn't it? Of course, mm. what you are equipped with at birth then has to go through development, right. and puberty in particular mm. is where nuances can be introduced. Um, and you can you can be like Castor Semenya, the South African runner, who is uh, classed as intersex. She is actually male, but her testes never descended. Oh, that's interesting. So she resembles external morphology, a female. Hmm. So that's that's the gray area, if you like. Right, and it's and not then, a new sex. It's just like it's a male that didn't have their testes descend. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's just what it is. It's like a guy wearing two <clears throat> shoes. It's not a oh, you came up with a brand new shoe. It's like no, I'm just. It's the same too. I'm just wearing them differently. It's like, oh, or I get it. Okay, cool. The same, same two feet, just wearing my shoes differently. Anyway, I did, we didn't even get to gender. Now we're going to get so many comments. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, feel free to leave them. You can find me at Let's Chat um, on this YouTube channel, as well as on our radio. Feel free to reach out to me on Let's Chat SC at gmail.com. John Richards, where can we find your stuff? Free Thought Productions channel. Nice, nice. That's Maybe. where most of my stuff goes. But of course, I'm also, I have a considerable presence on Atheism UK channel. Cool. Uh, maybe we will touch on gender next episode and, and other areas of dogmas presenting its head and, and lead ourselves to a better conclusion. Mm. Bujo, anything you'd recommend we check out? I need to get a, a fancy URL and just point everyone to one site and just put a bunch of stuff on it because I, I never share <laughs> it. <laughs> so.
<laughs> if you have a SharePoint yeah. account, you can do that immediately. All right. Yeah, and, you're right. Uh, Larry Rhodes, where can we find uh, your book on about how souls exist and how we need to uh, start <laughs> believing in them? Well, my book is called uh, Atheism, What's It All About? It's available on Amazon. My content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject. My YouTube handle is at Doubter5. If you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can get help from re, uh, with that at recoveringfromreligion.org. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Everybody.